Suppose you could move goods from the Pacific to the Atlantic 40% faster, with no need for locks, no worries about congestion, and no fear of running out of water. Would you do it? Mexico is doing exactly that. A massive project promises to cut the interoceanic journey down to just 20 hours, coordinating the flow of containers representing 5% of global trade, or about 220 million short tons of goods each year. Yes, they have openly outpaced Panama and are even backed by major world powers. But will they succeed? If they pull this off, how will it change the world? All right, let's start the documentary now. We all know that for over a century, the Panama Canal has been the shortcut between the world's two largest oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific. Nearly 6% of global trade, worth around $270 billion in goods each year, passes through this strip of water barely 330 feet wide. Over 14,000 ships from all around the globe glide through it annually, carrying Brazilian coffee, Australian coal, Korean chips, Japanese cars, and Chinese electronics. However, this giant canal is facing problems. Lake Gatun, the water source that keeps the canal running, has dropped to its lowest level in 60 years. Each time a ship passes, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fresh water are released into the sea, and this year, Rainfall hasn't been enough to make up for it. Droughts caused by El Nino have lowered water levels, forcing the Panama Canal Authority to cut daily ship transits from 36 down to just 20. Container ships now have to run at half capacity, carrying 50% less cargo to avoid running aground. In 2023, more than 200 ships got stuck in such a traffic jam, a major issue. If ships have to detour around South America, each one adds another 8,000 miles to its journey, burning millions of dollars more in fuel and losing weeks of valuable time. And while Panama scrambles to find water to save its canal, another country further north is preparing to take its place. No water, no locks required. President Andres Manuel López Obrador once made a statement that caught every investor's attention. We don't need a water canal. We have a rail canal. Yes, he's talking about the massive interoceanic corridor of Tehuantepec, a straightforward rail line connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific, promising to replace Panama in the near future. But you should know, this idea isn't new. Back in 1907, when the world still ran on steam, Mexico built a railroad across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, the shortest stretch between the two oceans, just about 115 miles. At the time, it was a marvel of Latin American engineering. Steel bridges spanning rainforests, steam trains pulling hundreds of cars through mountains and across rivers in just a few hours. In the early years, goods poured in like a flood. Oil from Veracruz, timber from Oaxaca, cotton from the south. The United States and Europe called Mexico the bridge of the world. But in 1914, when the Panama Canal opened, that dream vanished. Now Mexico is reviving that forgotten dream. But do you think Mexico just wants to make a little money from transiting goods? Not at all. This isn't just a project. It's a carefully calculated geopolitical strategy. In recent years, the concept of nearshoring, moving factories from Asia closer to the United States market, has exploded. From 2020 to 2024, Foreign direct investment into Mexico jumped over 40%, and in 2023 alone, more than 400 American and European companies announced plans to leave China for Mexico. They need a fast, reliable logistics corridor that won't get stuck at Panama. And Washington, while China controls nearly 40% of the trade in the Colon Free Zone, next to the Panama Canal, the United States wants to bet on Mexico its more reliable neighbor. So the Interoceanic Corridor of Tehuantepec isn't just an infrastructure project. It's a strategic move for all of North America, helping the United States pull its supply chains out of Asia and keep trade within its own geopolitical safety zone. Here's what makes it even more interesting. The CIIT isn't run by private companies. It's directly managed by Mexico's Department of Defense. 
To make this dream a reality, Mexico had to start from the sea. In the south of Oaxaca state, there's a place called Salina Cruz. It might sound unfamiliar, but in the shipping world, it was once Mexico's oldest crude oil port. The problem? It wasn't built for the 21st century. With an average depth of only 33 to 46 feet, it could only handle small oil tankers, giant 1,300-foot container ships, the kind that dock daily in Singapore or Shanghai, simply couldn't enter. So the Mexican government decided to do something unprecedented. Dredge over 35 million cubic feet of silt and sand, the equivalent of a million truckloads, to deepen the port to 75 to 79 feet deeper than China's Yangshan port, which is only about 56 feet. That's deep enough for post-Panamax ships carrying up to 24,000 TEU containers, the kind of ships Mexico had only ever seen in satellite photos. But just digging deeper wasn't enough. Salina Cruz sits on the Gulf of Tehuantepec, famous for fierce Category 5 winds and storms that can shatter steel piers. So they built a new breakwater, one mile long, twice as wide and taller than before designed to withstand Category 5 hurricanes and protect the port from waves up to 33 feet high. On the surface, hundreds of sensors and CFD simulation systems constantly monitor wind, currents, and waves, like a nervous system overseeing the entire port. Inside, the piers were reinforced with over 2,000 new concrete piles, strong enough to handle hundreds of thousands of tons of containers. Corrosion-resistant LED lights and automated crane rails are turning Salina Cruz into the most modern container port on Mexico's Pacific coast. And if Salina Cruz is where goods leave Asia, Coatzacoalcos is where they hit the shores of the Americas and Europe. Before its upgrade, the port of Coatzacoalcos struggled with severe silting, decaying piers, and ships having to wait for high tide to dock. The average depth was just 26 to 30 feet, so large ships often had to anchor offshore. To fix this, the Mexican government dredged the entire channel to a depth of 39 feet, moving millions of cubic yards of silt, as much as hundreds of football fields. This was called an underwater surgery to restore the port's ability to handle medium and large ships year-round. The new port was built as a multimodal hub combining container shipping, bulk cargo, and industrial goods all in one area. A container wall over 2,300 feet long was built to reduce wave impact and create space for automated crane systems. A key improvement? The CIIT railroad now runs straight into the pier, letting goods transfer directly from train to ship, eliminating the need for trucks, and cutting logistics costs and processing time. While Salina Cruz focuses on handling super-heavy ships, Coatzacoalcos aims for speed and efficiency. Smart electric cranes, automated container tracks, and bonded warehouses with digital customs clearance have cut cargo processing times from days to just two to three hours. But to connect these two massive ports, Mexico needed something even more vital, a new artery. That's the 188-mile railroad across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, running through jungles, hills, and swamps. The entire line was almost rebuilt from scratch. Thousands of workers removed old rails and rotting ties, replaced them with new reinforced concrete ties, and laid basalt ballast along the route to stabilize the track bed. In soft ground, Engineers raised the track with steel piles and built viaducts over marshy forests. They replaced 90% of the rails, and now a journey across Mexico takes just 15 hours, compared to one to two weeks of waiting at the Panama Canal. Each train carries more than 120 containers, the equivalent of a medium-sized cargo ship, gliding through Oaxaca's jungles and fields at 45 miles per hour. Passenger trains have also returned, running smoothly at 50 miles per hour, taking people to school and work, something an entire generation hadn't seen since the old line was abandoned. The stations have come back to life. Coatzacoalcos and Ixtepec stations are brand new, 
With digital screens, LED lighting, and automated warehouses. Meanwhile, century-old stations have been restored, keeping their original facades and tile roofs. When this route is fully operational, shipping time between the two oceans will drop by over 80%, cutting thousands of miles from each voyage and saving millions of gallons of fuel. Shipping companies won't have to wait a week at Panama, won't pay canal fees up to $500,000 per trip, and, most importantly, won't be at the mercy of the weather. For Mexico, this is a legal money printing machine, steady income from service fees, maintenance, warehousing, and logistics. More importantly, it gives Mexico new bargaining power with global shipping giants, something only Singapore or Rotterdam could dream of before. But the Mexican government isn't stopping there. Along the corridor, they're building a whole new ecosystem called Development Poles for Well-Being. The plan is to create 10 industrial zones stretching from Oaxaca to Veracruz, each with its own specialty, from petrochemicals, electronics, and logistics to high-tech agriculture and clean energy. The government provides electricity, water, fiber optics, and digital infrastructure. In return, businesses get almost total tax breaks for 10 to 15 years. Estimates say this network could create over 250,000 direct jobs, and counting the whole supply chain, that number could top half a million. Even more important, in southern Mexico, where 50% of Oaxaca's people and 45% of Veracruz's still live below the poverty line, where electricity still runs on generators and schools are hours away on foot, the new rail line brings jobs right to the tracks. Warehouse operators, maintenance engineers, cafe owners, drivers, mechanics. Tax money and investment now stay in the region instead of flowing back to the capital. Sounds amazing, right? But you know, whenever humans build something grand, nature demands its share, and Mexico is no exception. Look at Dos Bocas, the giant oil refinery complex on Paraiso Bay. When it opened, the media called it the energy milestone of the 21st century. But to make room for those shiny tanks, 30 to 49 acres of mangrove forest were cut down. The mangrove roots that once held the coast together were ripped out. The shoreline began to erode. And during rainy season, the Grijalva River floods as if in silent protest. Environmental reports say at least 4,000 animals from 119 species, including 27 endangered ones, lost their habitat. Marsh crocodiles, howler monkeys, migratory birds, all forced to leave what was once their home. Further south, where the hemisphere's strongest winds blow through the Tehuantepec Isthmus, hundreds of giant wind turbines now rise like a forest of steel. On paper, that's clean energy. But in reality, blades longer than a city bus spin at over 185 miles per hour at the tip, becoming invisible scythes in the sky. Ecologists have found hundreds of dead raptors and migratory bats scattered around the wind farms. Eagles, vultures, falcons, now victims of the very green energy humans praise. Worse, the migration routes of many bird species are being broken. Every year, their numbers quietly drop, like the slow death of a natural symphony. But you might not know, Mexico isn't the first country to dream of challenging the Panama Canal. In 2013, Nicaragua's government announced the Grand Nicaragua Canal Project, a mega-project funded by China's HKND Group, led by billionaire Wang Jing. The plan was for a 172-mile canal, three times longer than Panama and over 1,600 feet wide, big enough for oil and container ships too large for Panama to handle. The project was valued at $50 billion, promising hundreds of thousands of jobs and turning Nicaragua into the trade hub of the Americas. The problem? The canal would cut through Lake Nicaragua, the freshwater source for nearly half the country's population, and crossed dozens of indigenous settlements that had existed for generations. 
Scientists warned, even a small mistake could permanently salt contaminate the nation's water supply. When protests broke out, the project stalled. Then in 2015, China's stock market crashed. Wang Jing lost over 80% of his fortune, and Nicaragua's canal of the century became nothing more than a dusty blueprint in a drawer. Now the land once surveyed for the canal is marked only by rusty stakes and abandoned camps, a monument to a dream that never materialized. The lesson is simple. Ambition can move mountains, but it can't beat sustainability. The world isn't stopping at Central America. Far to the north, where there used to be only white ice and polar bears, a new route is emerging beneath the melting ice, the Northwest Passage connecting the Atlantic and Pacific through the Canadian Arctic. For centuries, it was just a deadly legend, where dozens of expeditions vanished without a trace. But now, with Arctic temperatures rising four times faster than the rest of the planet, ancient ice is retreating. If this route fully opens, ships from Europe to Asia could travel 4,300 miles less than through Panama or Mexico. No canal fees, no locks, no waiting. Some optimistic forecasts say the first ice-free Arctic summer could come as soon as 2035. More realistic estimates put it between 2040 and 2070. From a country once outside the flow of global trade, Mexico is now becoming the world's new crossroads. But every step forward comes at a price. Progress or sacrifice? Opportunity or illusion? That question still hangs in the air as trains rumble through the Tehuantepec jungle. So, what do you think? Can Mexico's land canal really change the map of world trade? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy stories about the wild projects shaping our planet, don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss the next documentary.